Well, after sp- speaking to Baldwin, Baldwin yesterday, um, oh, yeah, <laughs> I've got, I got my hands full with blue jobs. Um, <laughs> I'm with Flight Sergeant Dave Jenkins, who did 10 years in the Rhodesian Air Force uh, from 1969 to 1979. So, uh, Dave, I know we're not going to be able to do justice to everything, but um, just tell us how you how you ended up in the Air Force. I actually wanted to 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 join National Parks when I left school. Um, uh, a couple of my mates at school were were joining National Parks, and for some reason, I think my folks were against it a little bit. And they uh, we lived in Saluki, and a guy, Doc Saunders, was our yes local GP and his son Colin, I'm sure everybody knows, was very involved in conservation. Yes, I remember Dr. Saunders. Yeah. So where, where were you living? In, down in the Lofa? In Salukwe, yeah, we were in Salukwe. Oh, Salukwe, yeah, okay. Yeah. <clears throat> so anyway, Colin came to see me and um, yeah, we had a chat and eventually he said to me, look, Dave, you know, if, if you go to National Parks, but either first get a degree or a trade. And I thought, look, the degree is not at my, at my street. Eh? <laughs> and um, so I thought about a trade and um, I started working for a guy in Shabani, but I didn't really like him eh? in, the, in the motor trade. <clears throat> and then I got my caller papers. Eh? And um, so I went to him and I said, listen, I got my caller papers. And he said, well, you can go or I can get you deferred. But he said, if you opt to go, then you're not welcome back here. Well, I took the opportunity to bolt and I did my nine months and down at Llewellyn. And um, yeah, while I was at Llewellyn, I had to think about a job. And uh, I don't know if you ever knew a Sergeant Major Jardine. No. Uh, he was our instructor, one of our instructors, and he tried to get me to join the army, but I, I thought no. Nah. <clears throat> and then I saw an advert for the for the Air Force, and the big thing is they were offering fifty four pounds a month, eh? <laughs> free board and lodging, beers were nine pen- pence, I think, at the time. <laughs> <laughs> and and I'd been living with my folks and earning twenty four pounds a month at that time, and I gave my old lady fourteen for board and lodging. So I thought, shit, if I can handle the army, the air force is going to be a breeze. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> so, so I applied to join the air force, and yeah, I got accepted. Eh? Right, and then <laughs> so then I joined the air force in January sixty nine. <clears throat> I think I finished the army in November. 78, and then I joined January 69. Right. <clears throat> Excuse me. Yeah, and that was great. Eh? We we did um, six months in the ground training school, which was a fair, fair amount of square bashing, not a lot, but mainly all the technical theory stuff. Eh? Then after that six months, we went on to squadrons. Um, you could either go to Thornhill or stay at Serum. Um, I opted to stay at Serum. Um, I'm not sure why, but anyway, I opted to stay at Serum and, and then I went on to three squadron first uh, for four months. Then I went on to five squadron for four months. And then I did seven squadron for four months. And just it was what, while what, I was on. Uh, Dave, just tell us what those aircraft were, uh, because most people don't know. Three squadron? Uh, or... Sorry, yeah, three, three, three squadron with the old decks. And yeah, that was great fun. A nice bunch of guys. And, and uh, all that weren't. Officers were old school, hey. Uh, and then I went on to Fire Squadron, which was the Canberras. Um, then on to Seven Squadron, which was the Choppers. And that's when I decided that's that's where I wanted to go. Um, <clears throat> then from Seven Squadron, I went to Engine Repair Section for four months. Then we went back to Ground Training School for a further six months. And then, <clears throat> sadly, while we were in Ground Training School, um, one of the youngsters on Seven Squadron, I think at the rank structure then I think was junior techs, corporal techs, senior techs, etc. Um, he made a, a bit of a hiccup and he didn't put the the engine covers or secure them properly. And when they took off the chopper, picked up the or blew up the engine covers into the main rotor and damaged the aircraft quite badly. So a directive came out that Seven Squadron would be sergeants only. So that sort of stymied a bit. And I thought, well, now what am, where am I going to go? And the guys who'd been down at Thornhill had quite a few stories to tell. And I thought, well, I've been to Serum. Let me go down to Thornhill for four years till I could become a sergeant. And I opted to go or volunteered to go on to Four Squadron, which I'd heard about. And um, 
it was there. Oh, that was a good move, Hannes. Um, I, I went down there, and you know what a bunch of guys that was. I mean, on the on the tech side, there were guys. I'm sure even you know, I'll mention a few names because I'm sure some of the army guys, you ex-army guys, will remember them. John Britton, Doug Sinclair, um, Rick Singleton, Hugh McCormick, Henry Jarvie, the dreaded Jarvie, Phil Tubbs. Um, yeah, we had some really good guys, Ziggy Jellerman. And um, yeah, it was a fantastic squadron. We had a lot of fun there. Hey? Um, what aircraft, Dave? Four and squadron? then on that side, had, at that stage, we had the Trojans, hey? Okay. It was it was just the Trojans, hey? Um, yes. And a little later in about, I think probably end of 71, we we got the early 72, we, we, we took over some armed provosts as well. Right. So, yeah, and the pilots were, were a great bunch of guys. Um, initially, we had um, uh, Peter McClurk as our squadron commander, and um, I'm just trying to think who the flight commanders were, Rob Tosca, Gordon Wright, I think. <clears throat> but a lot of the pilots were young pilots straight out of wings. Um, so, you know, they were air subbies or, 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 or sub-lieutenants. Mm -hmm. Guys like John Blythewood, Greg Todd, Mark Ageson, Baldy Baldwin. Um, so yes, yeah, so, so there were a couple of scabangers amongst the pilots as well. Right? <laughs> <laughs> so you know, and what I liked about Four Squadron was as well was that you worked with a, a team. You know, that you became a team with a pilot. Whereas on, on, on one squadron, hunters and bamps and that, <clears throat> the only time you really got to chat to your pilots was when you were strapping them in. Um, so yeah, Four Squadron was a lot different, and we had a lot of fun there. Um, we had a our warrant officer, um, Bill Owens. <clears throat> I mean, this guy was a legend. Um, I'll, I'll just actually tell you a story too about him. Yes. But, but I would think he was probably Second World War vintage. You know, did his training then, um, was in the early South African, I mean, Rhodesian uh, Auxiliary Air Force or whatever those early days were. Right. And, and he met up and I think became quite friendly with Bucky McLaren, who became the um, Air Force commander. Right. And, I'll never forget one day we were working on some Trojans in the hangar and Bucky McLaren was doing a tour of the station and he, he walked into our hangar and the, the guy ah, that he was, he chatted to us and everything else and then he said, oh, is Spike around? So we said, yeah, yeah, he's probably in his office having a cup of coffee. So up he goes to Spike's office and, you know, he walks in there and it's, hello, Spike. And Spike, we knew he was, it wasn't morning, sir. It was, oh, hi, Bucky, how are you doing, you know? So the story went, and you know, and he visited our Spike before he visited our PB, our squadron leader at that stage. And yeah, so he, you know, that showed what a, what a gentleman he was. Eh? Um, then with our Spike, eh? yeah, his, his was Spike owns alias Wobbo, and then alias again Wobbo Talk. And Wobbo was for warrant officer Bill Owen, and he quite enjoyed that nickname. And then the Wobbatok got added, and uh, I can't give you the whole details, but it was warrant off the Bill Owens thieving old, I'll leave the rest to your imagination. And um, he had an, an aversion, anything, if it was shiny or even if it wasn't shiny, he, he had a tendency to pick things up and steal them. Eh? Amazing bugger, amazing guy. I remember working with Clive Menhenik on a Trojan when I first got on the squadron, and he was standing on some steps on one side of an engine and I was on the other side and he was showing me the ropes. And he said to me, Jinx, is your um, toolbox locked? I said, no. He said, well, I suggest you lock it. So I looked at him and said, you know, why must I lock my toolbox? He said, listen, if Spike comes here and he sees it open, he'll take something. So I locked my toolbox. Eh? Um, yeah, and he, yeah, he was he was just a, an amazing guy. Um, he had his men at heart and he would look after us through thick and thin. I remember one day he sent, he came into the crew room. We'd had a squadron party on a Saturday night. And he came into the crew room and he looked around and he said, hey, McCormick, Jarvie, I want you to go and do stock take down at the sports club. And then he looked around and he said, I'll take Jenkins and Parker with you. And because we were happy at that stage. Eh? <laughs> so off we got, changed into our blues down to the sports club. And um, Hugh, Hugh Mac, and, well, Jarvis was, was also another legend in his own way, but a, a naughty bugger. 
and he could get away with murder, man. I don't know how he did it. Anyway, we got down there and we start the stock taker and we do the beers first, I think, and suddenly we've got five, five empty crates and four and a half um, sort of full crates. He said, what are we going to do with a half a crate? Well, then the suggestion came, well, let's drink it. So we have now have six empty crates and uh, full crates and whatever. And so we drank those beers. Eh? And then came along, came the gin, and it was a quarter bottle of gin left. So we drank the gin. <laughs> and, and, and so it went through the system. Well, by the time we finished this um, okay. the stock tank, we were ratted, eh? absolutely ratted. And um, we staggered back to the squadron and we got to the squadron and uh, Mac and Charles said, listen, you two stay here at the hangar and we'll go and see Spike. So they walked up to Spike's office and and I don't, I don't know what happened in there, but anyway, Spike I said, where's Jenkins and Parker? Oh, we left them down at the hangar, told them to get on with their work. Well, he didn't, he didn't believe that. Eh? And he came storming down there and he found Andy and myself lying on the hard standing with our head against the curb stack. Well, I think by the time he'd finished with us, the whole bloody station was watching the performance. Eh? And then our punishment became making a, a, um, a barrier net for the runway. You know, they used to have a, a barrier net that they could whip up if, if an aircraft had a problem and needed to stop quickly. Eh? And um, I mean, that was like two inch thick um, rope. Eh? And he spent 10, 10 days, two weeks making all these knots, you know, to, our hands were buggered, man. Finished. But anyway, that was our punishment there. Eh? You know, he, he, he would give us a Christmas party every year. You know, he paid for the, the booze, the, the the food, everything. His wife laid it on. You know, before we went there, we, the guys made a plan. Look, we're going to go in one by one and into his garage or something and see if we can recover our own, own tools, you know. So the guys started this when we got there. And uh, I think after a while, Spike realized that there was something amiss there. And he snuck off in, down to his garage, and there he caught Ian Fleming, Flame Fleming, and um, Johnny Melton, Slam Melton, <laughs> looking for their tools, you see. So he came storming out of there, boy. And um, <clears throat> the guys came back and, onto the veranda. We thought, what's the next step? Well, our spike came out with a 410. And um, Flame, being a, an armorer, realized that this was quite serious stuff. Eh? So he bolted. <clears throat> and Johnny Melton jumped over the wall and I'll never forget he was standing there with, or sitting behind the wall with just his eyes over the top. <clears throat> and I'll fill tubs, tapping old Spike on the shoulder and saying, shoot him, Mr. Owens, just shoot him, man. <laughs> and um, anyway, we eventually calmed everything down and finished the party. <clears throat> but the kind of guy Spike was that, you know, come Monday morning, there was no problem. He didn't hold any grudges or anything. Dave, tell and me, you you? said this. Were you involved in any in any of the early operations in Mozambique with the Portuguese? Yeah, we were, um, Hannes. Um, I was just trying to think now. It was <clears throat> we, we had um, Peter McClurk as our squadron leader then. I think in probably end of seventy one, early seventy two. Squadron leader Peter Boyer, PB, yes. became our squadron commander. Yeah, <clears throat> and he he came up with this idea for for wrecking. I looked in my logbook, and I think it was May, May 72. Mm -hmm. So May 72, I think. Um, he took us up, the, the squadron up to, um, we went up to Kriba for a couple of days, and we did a bit of track recognition, um, trying to, to learn the difference between animal tracks and human track, you know, paths. We did that for a couple of days, and then we flew off to Gutsa. And that's... Um, and I was teamed up with John Blythe with Dave Rowe. And there was, then there was myself and a guy, Phil Dave. And when we got to Gutsa, we were, we were given grids to, 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 um, um, to Reiki. So basically what it meant was if you flew up on a line, got to the top end of, the, of, your, of your square, turned around, came back on another line, and then you, you came back again next to your first line. This was flying Trojans. This was in Trojans, yeah, yeah. yeah. And yet we had a 250,000 map each. And so every time you crossed a path, you'd plot it on your map, you know. And then you'd go down and come down and you'd see another path and you've got it. 
But eventually you started to actually get a picture you know, where these paths were coming to. And um, we'd done oh, quite a few runs. Eh? We'd been here one an hour or two. And um, I mean, but I, I don't know whether it was which one of us said, shit, you know, on the next run, we're going to find that all these um, paths are going to join in one place and that'll probably be a camp. So, yeah, well, that's great. Huh? Interesting. So, sure as eggs, we came back on the next run and these paths were coming together and, yeah, this must be a camp. So, John Blythe, would, he went into a left bank because he was on the left-hand seat, senior pilot. And we started flying around and we came a bit lower and then we could see the bashes. And I'll tell you, honestly, we, we must have been so naive, man. We flew there and we're looking at these bashes and suddenly now there's just gooks everywhere. And before we know it, there's just bullets coming all around us. And then the aircraft started taking hits. And before JR could um, bank, um, I think he banked right, if I remember, but before he could even bank, the engine started to cough and splutter. And um, then the cab filled up with smoke. Yeah, and now we, we're thinking this is it. How do four of us, and being blue jobs, we probably only had 20 rounds each in our, in our weapons, you know. And um, yeah, anyway, so, but we, we suddenly realized that the smoke in the canopy, in the cab was caused by a trace around that had come through the bottom and lodged into a, a roll of mutton cloth that we had behind the seat. So that got kicked out the door quite smartly and you know, the cabin cleared. And, but the, the engine was still running terribly rough, really rough. And John Blathard was playing with the controls. And, and I think at some stage he said to me, you know, come on, Jinx, what do you think? You're an engine fitter, what's the problem? And I just said, yes, we weren't, weren't taught about this at ground training school. Eh? <laughs> <laughs> So anyway, we, we flew back and we managed to get to good side. Huh? And, and that was quite a relief, I must admit, because- Where, where was this? Was, was this camp somewhere in Mozambique near the Zambezi? Yeah, we, we, we'd been, we were patrolling in Mozambique, yeah. I, I think we were north of the Zambezi, hey? You know, we were doing long trips. They were about five hour rides, if I remember rightly, hey? Anyway, so we, we got back to Goodsa and um, came into land and, you know, Jay, I put the flaps down, they were, that was a, another relief and put the main wheels on and we thought, well, we're on the ground. And then he put the nose wheel down. Well, we thought this aircraft was going to, to fall to pieces. And obviously what had happened around it, taken out the nose tire, the nose wheel. Mm -hmm. and, um, so, so the nose wheel was shimmering badly. But anyway, JR held it off as long as he could and eventually put it down. And, and then, yeah, we climbed out, had a look at the aircraft and counted the holes and but what had happened, one round had um, hit, hit the, the number five cylinder. I don't know if you know, the engines are horizontally opposed. They're not up and down like a car engine. Right. And so it hit the, the tappet cover on number five cylinder, and that was the, the valve, you know, the inlet and outlet valve mechanism bugger. So that's why the engine was running rough. And also the, the um, turbocharger had been hit, but I don't recall whether the turbocharger stopped working. Um, but if it had, it meant we were also now a normally aspirated engine. So yeah, I think we were quite lucky getting back. But you know, I met JR a little while ago and we got talking about it. You know, how naive we were, the way we just came down low and oh let's have a look at this little party here, you know. And it was the real stuff. Eh? So yeah, that was my, my first initiation into into being shot at, eh? Dave, um, yeah, Peter Pettaboya was very, he was very innovative, was he not in? He was very, very innovative. Um, he, he got um, involved later, I think after he left Force Squadron, he, um, he got involved in, in making the Gulf bombs and the Alpha bombs. And, um, and I think after he left the Air Force, I think he, he worked in Saudi Arabia somewhere helping one of those guys design bombs, eh? Yeah. Very much a thinker. Yeah. So, so yeah, it, it, it was um, it was a breeze then, hey, Hannes. Um, and you know, at, at the at the time, up until then, Hannes, I can just go back a little bit. Before before that had sort of happened, when we were on the squadron, we used to we only had two FAFs, Wanky and Big Falls, um, 
and some of the guys preferred going to Wangi. I think the attraction up there was the old Baobab Hotel with um, Queenie. I don't know if the guys remember Queenie. She was quite a legend in her way as well. And but I preferred Kariba. Hey? Um, yeah, there were more young girls there, I think, on holiday and stuff. <laughs> um, but, but through um, an ex-SAS guy who was in the Air Force full I, I got I met up with um, Stretch, Stretch Franklin and Andre Robbie. Um, became quite good friends. Well, became very, very good friends with Stretch. And so every time I went to Kariba, I used to catch up with him. And possibly when we get on to Seven Squadron, I'll relate the final, the final episode with Stretch. But yeah, Four Squadron was great. Eh? And then, and it's probably to go back to operations. Um, wow, Easter, Easter. Yeah, I know it was Easter, 70. Must have been 74. Easter 74, about Easter 74. Um, we've been, we'd continued doing recce's um, after our good episode, um, but they cut the crews down to just a pilot and a tech. And I think that worked out that it wasn't worth losing a pilot and four, four men. And so they cut it down to a pilot and a tech. And then, like I say, in May, I think it, was, it must have been April, April 74, that's Easter time. Isn't it? Yeah. We went up to Centenary, positioned at Centenary, the whole squadron. Um, and um, <clears throat> we started wrecking in Mozambique, north of Kabora Bassa. And it was then that, um, I think it was the Easter Sunday, that um, Chris Wyman and Pat Derrick were shot down. Um, so then fr fr from Centenary, we relocated to Estima, which I think is near New Magwe. But I, I believe that's probably all underwater now. Mm -hmm. And we moved up there, to, I think, to be closer to the search area. And um, at that stage, I was flying with Al Bruce in a, a Cessna 185. We'd acquired two from South Africa, from the, from the slopes. And um, they were in civilian markings. So we, we flew on our own because we didn't want to be identified with a military aircraft. Um, but then the rest of the squadron were, were flying in pairs. And um, well, in fact, when Chris was shot down, he was on his own. Um, and then when we moved to Estima and started the search and rescue, we teamed up with two aircraft um, and we searched for, wow, well, five or six days, I think. Eh? Yeah, I remember flying, when I was flying with Al, we heard Craig Todd call up and say that his uh, wingman, Willie Wilson and Roger Andrews had gone down. So that stopped the wrecking immediately. and. Um, Another search and rescue was put in, and the, I think the S, well the SAS guys went in. I don't recall if they if they bombed the camp before the SAS went in or not. Or but the SAS got there, and I believe it it was deserted, and um, they found Willie's aircraft, and I think Willie and Roger were still in it. And then they found Chris's aircraft that had they covered it with branches and buried him and Pat in shallow graves. Um, so yeah, that was a sad time for for the squadron. That was April April seventy four. Hey? So that's um, Hurricane time, Dave. Um, how much more involved were you in Op Hurricane around Mount Darwin Centenary? Tremendous. After 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 that, um, the war started really hotting up in, at Christmas seventy two. Was it when the, the Centenary farmers were at? And um, I remember it was act we were actually having another Christmas party. I, I, actually, I shouldn't be talking about these parties. Uh, you, you brown jobs will start getting upset. <laughs> but, uh, we, we, were, we were having a Christmas party and, um, and I remember PB and one or two pilots being called out and they came back in and they delegated a bunch of us to go up and, and arm some provosts with, with frantans and flares. Um, and, you know, we'd had a few beers and we were trying to arm these provosts. And, um, you know, the front end, you, you know, you'd have one guy in the front, one at the back, and you'd pick it up, but you had to push it hard, you know, with a bit of a thumb to get it to lock into its um, mounting. And, um, you know, the, the, one of the guys I was working with, Flame Fleming, had been, been burnt by a front end that had gone off. And, um, but, you know, you're carefree, you've had a few beers and but anyway, but we got them all loaded up and the next morning a, a bunch of guys flew up to Centenary and that was the beginning of those ops. Eh? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. You know, Centenary opened up and then 
Darwin opened up after that, and then Matoko. Um, yeah, and th those were certainly operational, and we were going there, there regularly after that, eh? looking after a Trojan and an arm provost. Eh? Right. And so yeah, they, fun days. When did you when did you go on to Seven Squadron on, on a more permanent basis? Look, I, I finished um, four squadron in November, December uh, seventy four, and I, I joined Seven on January seventy five. Eh? Right. Right. Initially, it, 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 it was a lot different to, to the end, the, the last phases of the war. When I joined, I looked at my logbook. It took me five months to get my half wing, my brevet. Um, you know, the intense, the, the training was very, very thorough um, and intense. And we had young pilots being trained at the same time. So um, we, we did um, hoisting and, and that around, I mean, the Seki flying area and it near Serum and LZs and things like that, tight LZs. And then as um, they, they were, oh, once there were a, a couple of pilots available for, excuse me, for gunnery, we would go down to Katanga, I don't know, five, five or six days down there doing gunnery, overhead attack patterns, passing patterns. Um, at that stage, we just had that single MAG. We haven't got onto the twin Brownings yet. Um, and I don't recall firing the, the cannon on, on those. I don't think we had the cannons, the 20 mils. But we did, we did that. Um, then you did mountain flying, and that was great fun. Gee, we, we started off with a trip up to Nyanga to, to collect trout fingerlings, which the, the national parks had put into big plastic bags. And we would take them down to Malseta. And I understand that the, the trout wouldn't breed in Malseta for some, some unknown reason. So um, we used to go and release those in the, in the streams there. And then we would spend a week or 10 days at Malceta Hotel. Um, and, and we were based there. And then we were going to the mountains flying. Um, and there we did really tight LZs, um, hoisting, cargo swinging. And the hoisting would involve putting a, a tech and, a, and one of the trainee pilots, you know, you'd, you'd hoist him down onto a precipice. And you had to take off the hoist, you'd fly off, come back 10 minutes later. Pick him up, you know. So, so both the pilots and the, and the techs got a feel for what it was like to be on the hoist. Right. And yeah, that was all great fun and um, some interesting cartel zeds. Sadly, I never had the the privilege of catching any of the outward board, outward board, um, outward outward bound woman swimming naked in a pool. <laughs> but uh, the, there were stories of of guys who were fortunate enough to do that. <laughs> um, but I wasn't, I wasn't lucky enough. Eh? Um, so yeah, we did, we did all that, Hannes, and, um, and then we became operational. And now it was you know, mainly, I think, fire forces and Kazovac resupplies, um, relay changes, a few small externals, but they were mainly, if I remember, recall, just bringing guys out who'd been dropped in there. Um, you know, I remember taking. Um, Ah, oh, man, uh, with this French guy, and he died recently. Um, Croaks, Dennis Crocan, dropping him and his French mate off in the, the top end of Zim and, you know, flying 20 or 30 Ks in, into Mozambique, dropping them off. And then we picked them up a, about a month later, I think. But, you know, which, which, which was those sort of operations, a lot of fire force operations. Eh? Uh, when I went to Seven, a lot of the young pilots that were on with on four squadron was, you know, with us came, came to Seven with us. And a bunch of us techs also went within a couple of months to each other. JB, Henry, Phil Tubbs, myself, Jim Paulson. And we were followed at the same time with John Rath, with Ken Newman, Chris Dickinson, Dave Rowe. Oh, yeah. So, so we all knew each other, or a lot knew a lot of each other, hey? which was fantastic. Hey? And um, but when we used to do the hoisting around um, in the Siki area, the, the trick of that the older techs and the pilots was to take you and to dunk you in PE dam and then drag you over the water and so forth, which, which was also great fun. But I remember the day Henry jo it was Henry Jarvie, and um, he, he knew he was going to get dunked that day. And um, the tech taking him on his training session was a guy, Finn Cunningham. But old Jarvis went and got changed, but he put Finn Cunningham's blues on, and then he put his... Um, is flying overalls over them and so anyway off they go 
and Finn dunks him in the pool and he comes, Henry comes back soaking wet and Finn's got a, he's screaming like a Cheshire cat. He thought this was great fun until Henry took his flying overalls off and said, hey, Finn, these are your blues, eh? Well, we all knew what happened to our blues after that, got wet, they shrunk to, to nothing, eh? And we washed off Finn at five o'clock trying to put his blues on and that was like Mission Impossible, eh? <laughs> but those are the sort of things Henry did. Hey? Um, oh, another one I must tell you about with Henry. Charles, myself, and Flame Fleming, we were working late one evening. And um, our crew rooms were being refurbished and everything else. And there were no lights in the crew rooms. So Charles and I went, went to wash up and get changed. And Flame Fleming was doing finishing the paper with the coffin. I nearly, you know, in the in the in the um, washroom, nearly put my hand into a tin of white paint, because the hand cleaner came in a similar five liter tin. And um, anyway, Charles sees this, and I can just see his mind ticking. And suddenly, he just took the hand cleaner out the tin, and he swapped the paint and the hand cleaner over. And then we went to get changed, and Flame Fleming came across, and um, stuck his hand into this tin of white paint, enamel paint and started to rinse his hands to get the grease off. Well, then he realized that it was white paint. And he came screaming out of there. I remember running out of there. I hadn't even got my shoes and socks on. I wasn't sticking around to have a tin five liters of paint thrown over me. And um, when, when Flame joined us in, in the pub afterwards, you know, he was still had hands you know, with paint drying on them. And, but that, well, that was Henry's sense of humor. He was a, and like I say earlier, he got away with murder. So what a great guy. Eh? Dave, you did you did a lot of fire uh, a lot of fire force work out of what out of Mount Darwin initially? Yeah, I think it was probably in, in Mount Darwin and, and Matoko initially, hey, but then you know, just as well as ideas, the war hotted up, hey. You know, Cherezi came five came in, um, Grand Reef, um, Cherezi, down to Mabalahuta, Malapati. Um, those ones down at the bottom end there, I think, was mainly supporting the, the SAS guys on, on their, their, um, their extractions. When was Optinga? I think Optinga was my first big one. My first. 77, I think. That was 77, November 77, wasn't it, John? Yeah? And where did, you, well, where, I, did you, where did you fit in to Optinga, Dave? Um, I was in the K, K car, in, in the command car with. Um, with Norman Walsh and Brian Robinson. Um, but quickly, before we go into opting, I, I think I'll just recount a story. Um, we were operating out of Malapati or Balahut, but I was flying with Terence Murphy, um, an ex um, Royal Marine chopper pilot, a nice guy. And uh, an SAS call sign had, had got into a bit of serious trouble and we were, were wanting a not quite a hot extraction, but they wanted to get out quickly. And it must have been a call sign of 12, which I think was unusual for you, SS guys. But anyway, they, we had to send the whole fire force, which was the K car and, and three G cars. And I was in a G car with Terence Murphy. But the one G car had gone to do a resupply or a relay change or something. And the decision was made to, to send the K car um, with one G car and the links above to see if they could start helping extract the SAS guys. So I waited with Terence Murphy till the other chopper got back. They refueled quickly and and off we went. But once we got airborne, would, um, the links called us and said that the SAS weren't um, where, where they said they were. They were, I can't remember whether they were further north or further south. So Terence Murphy we just changed, um, looked at the map, changed, changed the route, and we carried on. And we were just flying, and I, I just recall it, we, we, we were low, huh? we were low level. But to our left, there was a bit of high ground, and to our front, there was some high ground. But suddenly, all hell broke loose on us, eh? and um, there was small arms fire and some heavy fire coming, and I had never heard heavy fire before. This was my first time. and. Also, they were, we, they, they were firing RPG-7s at us. And these things were exploding in the air. But I recall looking, I, I started to open fire and Terence Murphy told me, don't shoot, don't shoot. I thought, yeah, that's strange, man. <laughs> There's hundreds of these buggers here, man. And um, 
then I looked out to the right at some stage. And I mean, this only probably took 30 seconds, a minute to happen. But I looked out to the right and I, I saw the other chopper to the right. And um, suddenly there was this huge explosion be, between sort of my, on my line of sight, but between us and the other chopper. And I remember saying to Terence Murphy, shut the other chopper's gone down. And then like two seconds later, no, no, it hasn't, I can see it. And, but, but now this guy, and I can't remember the pilot, eh? maybe Roger Watt, and, but he was now in the trees, not above the trees. Eh? He was low, low, low. Anyway, we got through all that. Eh? And, and amazingly, none of us had any hits at all. But that was my first baptism of, of heavy fire. Um, and it was, you know, in the pub afterwards, we were discussing, well, you know, what do you reckon they were? And um, probably 12.7s or 14.5s or whatever. And those big bangs and flashes, uh, they must have been RPG 7s with a, a time delay. Um, so I just want to mention that because we can discuss that again on Optinger. Did you, did you manage so, to recover the, the truth? So yeah, then we, 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 we got to the, the SAS guys and the, the first chopper, the cake on the first chopper, the, the, the G guy had picked up four guys, flown them 10 guys, came back, got the next four guys. <clears throat> so they'd managed to leapfrog them away from the frets. So when we got there, the, the guys were, were pretty secure and we just picked them all up and came home. But um, we took a different route home. I think previously we'd been doing bush tours of three weeks out, 10 days at home, which wasn't bad. Eh? And then suddenly when, when all the South Africans went home and left the choppers, we had to man the helicopters as well. And they brought a few of the, the ex-squadron guys back and um, so on and some of the old ex-pilots. And But it didn't really help much. And... Um, then the directive came out that they would bring bring youngsters back on, you know, from senior aircraftsmen up to corporal, um, which was a good thing because it took the pressure off. And slowly, as they trained up, we, you know, tours got a, a little bit stressful. Eh? But I, I just need to mention Mike Upton when he was ex RLI, a good guy, but a smart chap. Eh? He was, a, you know, when he was dressed in in his number twos. He looked a lot smarter than I could ever have been in my number ones. Eh? Um, um, and he, uh, he was a great guy. But when these youngsters came on, he just said, no, we can't have these gobbies on the squadron. This is not, not right. Eh? It's sergeants only. Anyway, eventually he, he, he um, calmed down a little bit. And as the guys proved themselves, he, he, he became less hard on them. Eh? But initially he was quite tough on the youngsters. Eh? And um, in fact, if I show, I'm sure if you talk to Beaver again, he'll tell you all about about that, eh? Um, Rob Dingo, that, that, that was definitely my first, first big, big goal. And who was, who was the pilot? Um, when, well, it, 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 if we go back to probably the beginning, I looked at my logbook and I'd been down at Malaparty flying with Nigel Land. And we came back to, to Serum, I think on the 22nd of November. And um, we, got, we had the night off, came back the next morning, <clears throat> and then we knew there was something happening because a lot of choppers were back at base. You know, things were sort of just happening. Eh? And then that morning of the, the 22nd, we, um, we went to a briefing at, at the photo section. It was just for the squadron guys, I think. And they showed us the maps, the area of photograph maps and so on and so forth. And, you know, this thing, yeah, that's a, an anti-aircraft gun, this is this. And, I seem to remember them showing uh, where, 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 where the, the workshops were, um, the parade ground, and I think Mugabe's headquarters or whatever it was. <clears throat> so, so we had that briefing and we were told what it was about. And I remember Norman Wall saying that we expected losses, of, and I think I said between 10 and 15 percent. Eh? Um, it might have been higher, but I, I remember looking around and thinking, should next Week, there's going to be some of us not around, eh? But fortunately, that didn't happen. So, yeah, we, we had that briefing. We went back to the squadron, um, and uh, Jeff Gardner was our warrant officer, and he started allocating us our aircraft. And guys going on to K cars, going on to G cars. And then he came to me and he said, Jinx, you're on the, the command ship with, with um, Norman Walsh. And he said, he said to me, Your job is to make sure this aircraft stays airborne at all costs. And I looked at him and I said, shut, Jeff, man. How am I going to keep it airborne when we're going to get shot out of the sky? 
And he just grinned at me and said, that's your problem. Uh, anyway, so, yeah, so that was the beginning of the afternoon. In that afternoon, which I'm going down now, it's the 22nd, if I remember right. It, it was a big briefing, if I recall correctly, in the one half of the um, parachute training hangar. And the guys had laid out, a, I assume it was a, made out of paper mache, but there was a, a big um, image of the, of, of the complex. And um, the guys walked around this image. I, I assume it was Brian Robinson. Um, I didn't know him at the stage. And the other guy was Norman Walsh. And then there was, I think, some aerial photo photographic guys who gave the briefing and the brown jobs that were there, you know, could see what they, they're tossed to. And then we went back to the squadron, um, finished servicing um, in the the Corpus Club had been made a, an all ranks club. We weren't allowed off camp. We weren't allowed to talk to anybody. And they made the Corpus an all ranks club, which we had supper there, a few drinks. Um, and I think we were all in bed probably by half past nine, ten. We just slept in the hangar on our stretchers. Um, then we were up early the next morning. But it must have been first light, five o'clock. We were airborne um, and we flew up to excuse me, sorry, up to, to Lake Alexander. And there we refueled again. I think we got to Lake Alexander at about, about seven. Eh? And they refueled and I think we had to wait a while. And, and I remember it being a little bit worrying because the, the weather was clamping in a bit. Um, anyway, it was time to get airborne. And um, we got airborne and it was a battle. Um, and I don't remember who was flying the lead helicopter. It, it might have been Squadron Leader Griffiths. I think he was the, our squadron commander. Anyway, he, he was he was on the KCON. He he managed to find a route. He weaved through the Gormos a bit, and we found a, a way through the the cloud. And you know, once we got out of that, then it was just clear sky. Unfortunately, all the squad, all the choppers managed to to come through, and um, and we we flew um, we flew off down towards Chimoy, hey, which was. But anyway, we, we, we headed off to Chimoy and, and New Farm, whatever it was called. Um, and that, I think, was about a 20-minute, a half-hour flight to get there. Um, anyway, we, we were getting close, and um, we could hear the, the, the cameras, the, the hunters and the cameras, and the, the DAX talking a bit, and the DC-7. There was just a little bit of chatter, not much. And then I remember hearing the, the hunters calling target visual or something. And you know, then we knew the hunters were going in. Um, and I think the, the first um, first hunters were just um, were, were guns and rockets. And then the next pair of hunters, I think, were I think they they dropped the frantans. And then right behind them, then then from there, once the frantans went off, we, we saw the smoke. And it wasn't far away, four minutes from flying maybe. And then the cans came in in front of us and. We, we could actually see the flashes from the alpha bombs. And then once we got up, right up to the, the contact area, um, Norman pulled up to, and I think we were flying at 800 feet above ground level. And the, G, the K cars were at 800, at, at 500 feet. So we had, but the K cars, and I, I, I never understood the, the planning at the time, and I, I should have asked afterwards, but I didn't. If I recall, and and I stand to be corrected yet. I recall that the RLI troops were, were, were the heli born guys and they were dropped on the northern side of the camp. And the DAX came down on the, the right, which would have been the, the western side. And then they sealed off the southern side. But we didn't appear to drop anybody on the, on the eastern side. And, but I, I stand to be corrected there. But I, I seem to remember the time thinking, yes, why well, haven't we boxed this in properly? Anyway, so it, it, all that went up to, to plan and um, the guys parried out and choppers dropped the RLI guys. And, but as the, as the guys hit the ground or deep bust from the choppers, they were into contact straight away, which I think was a little unexpected. Hey? Um, and, and, and there were some fierce punch-ups going on. And there were, you know, I remember just looking down and seeing all these gooks, hundreds of them, I guess, literally hundreds of them. And um, I think also finding it frustrating that I couldn't do anything with, with my twin Brownings. Eh? 
sorry, I must just quickly mention here with my twin browning. When I woke up in the morning to, to a new position to Lake Alexander, Lady Henry Jarvie and Phil Tubbs had got um, these long cylindrical cardboard tubes that our control rods used to come in back then. And they'd strap these over my twin browning muzzle, you know, the, the barrels. And so they stuck out about a meter and a half, you know. And I remember Jarvis saying to me, he said, oh, there you go, Jinx, eh? that'll stop him fucking shooting at you. <coughs> Excuse me, sadly, it didn't. But um, yeah, so we were, we, were, we were up above circling. I think the right word is confusion there. Eh? Um, uh, Brian Robertson was trying to control his troops and he, <coughs> excuse me, he couldn't get a sweep going, if I remember rightly. Um, because the guys were in such heavy punch ups that they, you know, they were just, just shooting all over the place. And then the K cars were mainly on the, on the eastern side. Um, there, were two, there were two choppers on the, on the western side taking out the, um, the hospital. And I think, and if I recall correctly, that the, the, the first bunch of paratroopers were dropped between the, the um, hospital and the main main complex. So the hospital was out of the sweep line, behind the sweep line. The two choppers were in there and the, the one chopper was hit quite early on and had to, had to pull out. And I remember, I think it was Caps Newman. And he was the sort of guy who had that sense of humor, but I remember him calling up and saying, saying something to the words, um, there's hundreds of these bastards here. And they all got automatic crutches and shooting the shit out of us. And um, it, it got quite serious. And I remember Norman Walsh putting in a couple of cameras. He, he threw a couple of cameras in to try and silence that. And I think probably previously they thought, well, that's the hospital. They won't be too active down that end. Eh? So, yeah, and we carried on orbiting probably probably for about an hour, 15 minutes, an hour. And uh, we could see a lot of the, the trace and the flak going down at the other aircraft. Um, and like I say, unfortunately, we couldn't do anything about it. Eh? Um, so while Brian was trying to get his troops organized, Norman Walsh was trying to get aircraft hitting strikes, you know, anti-aircraft positions that hadn't been taken out. And there were far more anti-aircraft positions than we had, had realized. You know, I remember on the maps they showed us what an anti-aircraft position looked like, you know, and it had a bunkers and bags around it and all that. But they, they had a whole lot under the trees that, that we hadn't seen, and they were the problem ones. Um, so yeah, it, there was there was definitely confusion at the beginning. Then the the K cars were, were so busy that they were they were running out of ammunition you know, quicker than expected, I think, and they were retreating to the admin admin area um, where Boss PB had set that up. Um, while we we're on the admin area, quickly, I was, I'll just mention that now. Um, George Alexander, and I'll never forget this. He was flying the DC seven that was dropping the fuel and the, the ammo to PB. And PB had been flown in by chopper and uh, he was to, to position the, the DC-7 to drop where he wanted the stuff. Well, the DC-7 got there early, about two minutes early, if I recall. And um, was PB was trying to tell him to hold off and, um, and then the DC-7, I think, flew over the area and, but didn't drop and then had to come back again and yeah, in fact, this was a proverbial cocker. And PB was shouting at George Alexander, and oh, George was a, of Greek descent. Eh? And then there was one God Almighty punch up with George Alexander throwing his toys out the cot. And, and, um, and, and unfortunately, he dropped the fuel in, in not where they wanted it. It was spread out over some pretty rough terrain where the choppers now had to go and refuel. But anyway, that was all sorted. Eh? So, yeah, back to the. To the op, we were, we were still flying around and um, and hadn't taken any flak, which was amazing, until suddenly we we had this bloody um, twelve point seven bloody um, latch onto us, and he was revving us. And um, I can remember Norman Walsh. He'd done he'd been off choppers for a long time. Um, he'd flown them years, a few years earlier, and he'd done a refermal course so that he could fly on this op. And he said, what's that funny noise? Well, I mentioned that um, incident with Terence Murphy, so now I knew what this, this noise was. But before I could say anything, we took a hit in the, one of the main rotors. Um, 
and one through the tail boom, which we, we only knew once we landed. But all credit to Norman, as soon as we took that first hit, he, he had the aircraft down on the tree. So, um, we were sort of chatting about it, what to do with it to land straight away. And anyway, we decided, well, if the, as long as the vibration doesn't get any worse, let's head for the admin center and, um, and then we can sort it out there. But in the meantime, now, Brian Walsh had, had lost comms with his guys because we were, we were out, of the, out of the fight. Brian Robinson. And Norman had handed. Sorry? Brian Robinson, you mean, had lost touch? Brian Robinson, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, because, because, because we, we were heading to the, we were low level now heading to the admin base. And um, um, Norman Walsh had handed over to uh, Lynx that was above us which had been planned that he would take over if there was a problem. But no sooner as he'd taken over and he was taken out. So now we'd lost, we'd lost comms. Eh? Um, and I can distinctly remember Brian being really concerned about um, gooks breaking out, particularly to the east, because the, the K cars up there were, were refueling and rearming. So there wasn't a lot of effort going in there. And Norman had been trying to get the hunters and canvas to, to re-bomb and restrafe the areas. And now without a Lynx to, to take control, yeah, um, yeah, that we were worried, or well, the commanders were worried for a while. And, <clears throat> excuse me. And then we, we landed at the admin base, had a quick look, saw the hole in the main my rotor blade. Fortunately, it, it didn't hit the, the leading edge where your main spar was. It had gone through the, the, pro, the, the blade profile and just made a, a huge hole there. <clears throat> and then there was a hole in the tail boot. <clears throat> so yeah, we only took the two hits. So if I recall correctly, we, we, we swapped choppers. We got into a K car that was standing by, a G car that was standing by to uplift troops. Um, got back to the contact area. But the problem now that arose was um, the chopper we were in had been rigged out with extra radio so that Brian could talk to, Brian Robinson could talk to his guys and Norman at the same time could control aircraft. Well, now with this G car that we, we we took over, we took on, it only had the standard aircraft radio. So only one of us, one of the guys could talk at, this, at any one time. So obviously Brian's trying to control his guys who are now sort of starting to get a grip of the situation. And he was hoping to get a sweep line going, which I think was initially the guys on the southern edge, the bottom edge. Um, and Norman was trying to get aircraft to, to do additional strikes and. Yeah, it, it was interesting, hey? but my, I'll take my hat off to those two. So they, they stayed calm and they controlled it well. Hey? Your, your chopper was recovered. They brought in a new, 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 brought in parts and got it flying. Yeah, yeah. in fact, what they did was um, they quickly whipped um, blades off a, 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 a G car that was already on the ground. Um, and, and the techs that were on the ground with Mike Parker. <clears throat> I think Mike Parker was the senior guy there. They just did a blade change onto our chopper. And once that was done, which took probably 45, 45 minutes an hour, we went back and, 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 and um, took out our chopper, took the original chopper over again. Um, but yeah, they just put the blades on. Obviously, they didn't have the equipment to do the full rigging, but they just did a track check with a stick and a piece of cardboard. And um, yeah, we, we got airport. We went back and picked up the our, our original G car and um, got back with, with all the radios. And then it, then it made it a lot easier again. Um, but yeah, the, the call signs were still having lots of punch ups. I can remember there was a blue one, blue, unfortunately, where a, a K car opened up on an oral stick. Sadly, I can't remember the stick leader's name. Um, and I think he was quite badly injured. But, and I think two or three of his stick were injured. But fortunately, they, they, they managed to stop that cake or shooting before he did any, before he killed anybody. <clears throat> then the SAS lost one guy, a troopy. And I think they also had, in fact, and then I know they had one guy wounded, which was um, um, Daryl Watt. Yeah. I only, I only found out that much later, a few, a few years ago, probably six years ago, when I visited Daryl on his conservancy. Um, we got talking about the op, and he told me he'd taken a shot in the leg. Yeah, but I, I didn't. I didn't know it was him at the time. And um, Dave, did you then go on to Tenby the next day? 
Yeah, we did. Yeah, um, but th that op, um, it, if I recall, it was supposed to be done and dusted in a day, and and by sixteen uh, sixteen hundred when we were seventeen hundred when we were supposed to be pulling troops up, the the, the battle was still going on and. Um, I seem to recall SP had been picked up and taken in to start um, looking for documents and stuff like that, but there was no way as we were going to finish. And I remember Brian Robinson calling up walls in the in the um, in the command deck and asking permission if he could if he could leave guys overnight. And um, obviously walls gave gave permission because a controlling factor there was that the thumb chopper that had gone back to, I suppose they were the choppers that had gone back to get the spares, because we had to do an engine change as well. I think the chopper that was shot up over the over the hospital required an engine change. So, and I think it was the choppers that went back to to um, Lake Alexandra to collect the spares, reported that the weather was closing in on the mountains again. So that was also a factor that the, the, the commanders had to take into consideration. But we got, if I recall, we probably got about half the guys out in, in, on the first day, the third or up to half on the on the first day, and the rest of the guys had to sleep sleep over. Um, I think there were some quite quite big contacts at night. Um, yeah, I'm sure there were, if I recall correctly. Hey? And then the next day, the SAB, S, SB finished their searching, and I think Boss PD was sent back in to assess the damage caused by his alpha bombs uh, or golf bombs, one the alpha bombs, his, the, the little bouncing ones. Um, yeah, and I think I think it was only late that afternoon that we, we got the last of the guys out, which yeah. was sort of a day a day longer than than we than, than the planners had anticipated. That. Yeah, so I, I think I think that was that was um, I don't know, Tanis, maybe you would know, but I think it was called Ob Zulu, the first part, Zulu one and Zulu two. Yeah, I think that's right. Yeah, yeah. So Zulu one came to to an end, and then. And they had code, name, code names for each 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 um part of the opera. And I, I don't remember what they were, but I remember like once um once the troops had been dropped, whatever was relayed back to the command deck. So stage one was over. When the admin base was up, stage two was over. But that they had more fun, fancy names. There. And yeah, so I think that was basically oh the the sad thing there, we also lost um Phil Haig, hey? You know, that he was flying a vamps and yeah. the vamps had <clears throat> the vamps had been allocated that there was a target northeast of of the main setup that um, only the aircraft went at. And I think the vamps were allocated that target initially. Um, and Phil Haig um, took a round into the engine and he managed to get far back as far as Rhodesia, but he was forced to crash land into a field and Sadly, it was a donger or whatever at the end, and, and that, that took him out. Mm. So, yeah, our only, our, therefore, our only casualties then were Phil Hag, the SAS Troopy, and then those couple of injuries. Dave, were you um, involved down at Mapai with the big um, the bridge blowing and the, and the big attack on Mapai? No, I wasn't on that. Eh? I think I'd, I'd left the Air Force by then. Eh? Because when when was that, Hannes? Yeah, it was it was um, seventy nine when Dick Paxton was shot down. Yeah, no, I'd left the Air Force then. Hey, yeah, old Tricky Dicky, yeah, good guy. Yeah, Dave. Any other um, events that come to mind that you want to talk about? That I can think of, Hannes, uh, on on the on the on the Dinga, on, on the Chimoy raid. Hey? The sad thing I remember was that Mugabe and them weren't there. They were. I think it was all planned, or, or, or they thought that they would be there. And who was the guy who got the, that suitcase with all the money? I think it was an SV guy eventually. Picked, it, picked up a suitcase full of money. I seem to remember one of the SAS calls signing, calling and saying, yes, we've got the money. And um, it turned out that an SV guy got it eventually. <laughs> <laughs> which, which pissed the Browns off. Eh? Um, so, sadly, you know, honest, I can't remember the guy's name, so. No, it doesn't matter. Johnny Norman was on that. Johnny, Johnny Norman was, uh, he was wounded there. Uh, was he the guy wounded by the KCOC? Sorry? He the guy wounded by the KCOC. Yeah, Hannes. And, well, then, and then obviously the next step was up to, up to Tembui, hey? 
on that Shimoy road, there was that SA school sign that 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 that, that got that um, white pickup, and we we're driving. I remember them driving around, flat out in this white pickup. That they had commandeered that I, I presume from from that I mean the workshop area. It might have been Bob McKenzie or somebody. Yeah, I think it was. But I remember them driving around and and um, and um, Robinson and Norman Walsh killing Erio to make sure they didn't that he shoot them up. And, and in fact, I think those guys actually found some 12.7s on on, um, on platforms, which we, we didn't know about. You know, I seem to remember guys calling and saying they'd found um, um, anti-aircraft guns on, on platforms. Yeah, so anyway, we fr from there we repositioned to, we all eventually ended up at Mount Darwin f f from, from Chimoy. And I think we went, we went Norman Walsh, found Robinson, myself, went straight to Matoka, if I remember, from from refueled at Lake Alexander and then went straight to Matoka and got there the, the afternoon before the raid. Um, the other guys came from, I think some choppers came from Salisbury. Anyway, we, we all positioned at that Mount Darwin the night before. Um, I remember five, five or six choppers were delegated to take a team of Air Force guys and RLI guys up onto the train, the, the train in Mozambique, north of... Um, uh, north of the border, and that was where we were. our first stop was going. Refueling stop was going to be. So the guys had to set that up, um, and the DC seven dropped fuel to them early the next morning. Um, but they, they they went up the night before, cleared that, spent the night there. Then we left Mount Darwin early in the morning. We flew to flew to Chisweti where we did another refuel. Then we flew twenty minutes, half an hour, whatever it was, to the train, refuel there. And then it was the, the long haul to, to Tembwe over Kaborabasa. I think that was about an hour flight to get there. We didn't initially have a lot of time over the target because I think our fuel time was about an hour 45. So we probably only had 45 minutes over the target before we would have had to go and refuel. Um, and I think because of the distance from, from our nearest refueling point, no, no choppers were used to chop up the guys in. All the guys would drop our deck. Um, they all parachuted in. Yeah, I remember flying over Kaburabasa and then we got to Tembe and it was a, a very similar, a similar operation. Um, the hunters went in first. And um, if I recall that, the hunters didn't use um, Frantan this time. They used the new fleshettes that BB had, had copied from the Yanks, I guess. Um, uh, we <clears throat> they threw them and then the cans came in with their, their alpha bombs and then the smoke and the dust came and but it, it wasn't nearly as as, as hectic as um mm. as chimoy hey? um, and then my, our feeling at the time was probably that the guys had probably heard about chimoy and bolted but yeah there was a, a fair amount of anti-aircraft fire and stuff and and work to do but it, it was nothing like chimoy and uh, there were a lot of trenches i remember there were a lot of trenches the guys had to clear and that had to be just troopies. Eh? The, the, the aircraft weren't that effective against those. Eh? Just looked at my notes, but, but there were there were two camps there, um, Hannes. We and I think the decks more or less surrounded the whole the, the both camps. Um, and like I say, the Chimue one still fascinates me. Why we didn't put guys on the eastern side? And, but I recall at, at Tim we we, we they more or less surrounded the area. Um, and the guys, then the guys, and I remember Brian Robinson was, it, it was much easier because the, the troopies that landed weren't under immediate fire and contact. So he, he managed to get his stop groups and sweep lines and everything organized quite quickly. And they they were going through, it, it was running, it was a smooth operation. Eh? Right. But yeah, there were the punch ups and everything else. And yeah, and, and we didn't have any losses out there, I don't think. Certainly no aircraft losses or, or airmen losses. Eh? Ops that you were involved in after 10 weeks. Uh, after 10 weeks. Gee, there weren't a lot. Of, we did, we did, did one or two small ones into um, into Zambia, but again, that was mainly picking up SAS guys. Eh? I think they'd been blowing up bridges. I wasn't involved. I'd left when those those big ops in, into um, Westland, Westlands was it? Not that Westlands Farm, the Green Needle ones. I, I'd left by then. Eh? Dave, were you involved so, in any, any any VIP? Stuff with the politicians, with Ian Smith? Um, no, I never flew Ian Smith around. Flew, um, 
uh, PK around. Uh, I remember flying an, a, a British Army general around once. And that, that you know, was, well, I wouldn't say strange, but I, I wondered why at the time an army, British Army guy was there. But why I remember it was he took a photograph of my, my he made me hold my bloody bone down up so he could take a photograph of it because an RLR troop he had painted on the back for me. Yea, though I fly through the valley of death, I shall fear no evil, for I'm the meanest son of a bitch in the valley. <laughs> and this, this British Army guy thought this was great, eh? Hey? Was that yeah, after that, was the, that must that must have been after the after, after the end of the war? What was the British Army officer doing there? No, it was during the war, and it was it was from um, we were at Grand Reef. I remember reading an article about it where he made the comments that we were the fight, the, the best fighting force in the world. You know, anti-terrorist. Oh, uh, that, was, uh, that was General Walker. Yes, I, I think he'd left the British yeah. Army by then. And he came up. Uh, heavy, uh, yes, and he uh, came heavy. up to to see what was going on. Yeah, that's yeah, that's right. So you you spend a bit of time with Pika as well. Yeah, with Pika, he he was fun there. Eh? Yeah, and yeah, he he had a good sense. He always had booze with him. Eh? My goodness, <laughs> he, he was never short of booze. That guy, I think it was brandy eh? Did he? or whiskey, whiskey. I can't remember. Uh, yeah, he was short of a bottle of booze, and he used to dish it out. Eh? I can remember being at Yamasoto with support commander, I think it was, when I was mean, still on four squadron. And um, <clears throat> the guys, the Oralam guys were operating in Mozambique and they cleaned up a few camp areas and stuff. And then they were going back to burn the, those food um, um, huts, you know, where they used to store their food. And they were, and they were going to go and destroy the villages and everything else. And I was quite friendly, friendly with Ant White and I was talking to him and he said, well, he said, why don't, why don't I take a troopie out and you go as one troopie and they'll burn? And I thought, oh, this would be good fun, man. Yeah, instead of sitting on the ground. Yeah. So I went with one of his sticks and we got out there and we're burning our way. Yeah, whatever, whatever. Suddenly the stick leader gets this on his radio, gets contact, contact, contact. I thought, shit. Anyway, the chopper came in and I'll never forget it was Ian Harvey. He landed and then we climbed and off we went. Eh? And we landed with... We were where they wanted us, and the three troopies got out, and I sat there. And you know, he said to me, "Get out!" I said, "What? I'm a blue job. Man. I, I'm not into this thing." He said, "Get out!" Eh? Yes, and I had to leopard crawl with these brown jobs through the bush. Eh? Unfortunately, the contact didn't develop into much, and so I wasn't. I never got my arse shot off there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, those were the fun times we had. Eh? Yeah. Well, Dave, I'm gonna. Thank you very, very sincerely for your time and more good stories. Uh, it's a pleasure, Hannah. It's nice to talk to you and catch up with you, right? Eh? Yeah. Dave, um, we're no, close enough. To... We must get together. Yeah, no, definitely, Hannah. Definitely. You know, I go to all your RLI um, reunions and that, you know, well, the, the memorial a couple of weeks ago. And that's where John conned me, I think. John got me. Yeah, there. sorry, I didn't make I didn't make that one, but um Yeah, yeah. But I'll, I'll um, hopefully we meet at the next at the next one. In fact, have you, have you got a minute left, Anna? So you know a, a guy you need to do is um is Mike Borlas. If you if you could get hold of Mike, eh? We Mike Borlas and I were stationed at, at um Kariba. And like I told you earlier, I got friendly with um with Stretch. And he he had left the army, but he was still at Kariba. And so I used to, whenever I went to Kariba, I'd bloody call him up and we'd go for a few drinks. And I had a drink, a couple of drinks in one evening. And I think it was two days later, Mike and I got called for a Kazavak. And we were actually based, uh, not, not at the, down no, the Estra, but at the army camp on the on the heights there. So we whipped over to the, to the, um, the hospital. And who did they load in was stretching. Mm. And he'd come off his motorbike. Yeah. Anyway, we flew down. We were told to take him down to the airstrip where there was a, a pro aircraft to take him. And um, so we did that and we got there. And um, I helped get him out the chopper and then other guys carried him to this fixed wing about, I don't know, 50, 60 meters away. And Mike and I sat there and we watched. And uh, these guys were screwing around and the, the door was on and then they took the door off and then they couldn't get stretched in because, you know, he was a tall ladder. And it was, oh, now we've got to get the co-pilot seat out. And 
I went to Mike. I said, you know, I don't think they ever can. It doesn't matter what they do. They'll never get this guy in there. And Mike said, don't tell them we're refueling. And if, if they're still here, we're taking stretch. So we whipped up to the heights. We refueled, came back, and stretch was lying under the wing of the aircraft. So we loaded them in, and off we went with the nurse. And, and very, very sadly, he, he, he died about just as we came into Arari, over the outskirts of Arari. And yeah, I've got to be honest, I shed a tear there. Because hey? yeah. we were good mates. I think it was because I was so cross that if only we had taken him straight from the hospital to Arari, he Long probably man. would have had half an, half an hour or so in hospital with the top guys and maybe have saved his life. Hey? But that, that was a sad day. Though. Very sad. Hell of a guy. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, and then um, oh, we had some... Uh, interesting times. If you if you if you, if you want to hear another story was when we was flying Mike with Mike and Mike was called off to go and and do a, an op in Zambia. But he, we were on the K cart Matoka, and he said, "Are you coming with me?" And I said, "No, nah, man, I don't want to do trooping." I said, "I'll stay. I'm going to stay on the K cart." And a guy, Ted Lund, took over from Mike. But Mike and I had been into Rory a few days before to change our aircraft over, and Mike saw this. A modified pilot seat on the ground and uh, he said to me come we've got to fit this and I said no bullshit man you've got enough bloody armor plating you know maybe I should have it anyway he convinced me and we put this um, seat into the chopper and and this is where fate plays a hand eh? we um, got back and then Mike went to, on this trip to Zambia and I stayed with Ted Lund and uh, we got called out by Slew Scouts to a, a call sign to a a sighting and we got there and these gooks were we were on a rocky rocky a really rocky hill but for the, for the love of god we couldn't see these bikers eh? we pulled up and couldn't see them and so ted Lund said i said to ted let me let me just put two or three rounds into that four more and that's going to flush them and he said no no we can't waste ammo he says i'll come past low and slow and see if i can draw fire well i'll tell you the cake of commander the brown job and i looked at each other sideways eh? I've got a feeling it was Pat Armstrong. I might be wrong. Anyway, we came past low and slow, and we took a stonking. Eh? Yeah. And one round um, came through the, through the cockpit and hit this, this new seat where they just added an, an extra little bit of metal to, to, to protect the, the, the pilot's cheek. And it, it hit there. Shit. But if that hadn't been there, that would have been Ted Lund finished, and we would have lost a chopper and three men. You know? Um, and um, I must admit, I, 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 I had a run in when, when we, that evening because I said, you know, you, you, you want to save two rounds, three rounds of ammo, but you nearly lost a chopper and three men, you know, plus a, a box full of ammo, never mind two rounds. Um, but yeah, that was a narrow, very, very narrow escape for us. Eh? And, you know, we, 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 we um, traced the rounds that came through the canopy and how the army commander, and I think it was Pat Armstrong, how he wasn't hit, I don't know, because we had pieces of string and trying to follow where these rounds had gone through. And yeah, he should have been taken out. Eh? But we lost our radio and all we could do was receive incoming calls. We couldn't transmit and we couldn't talk to each other in the chopper. So, you know, the, the, the army, the, the new scouts are saying they're running down the river. So I'd look down the river, see something and try, try and get my gun to bear. And then Ted Lunt would try and get the chopper straight because we couldn't and help each other, you know, to, to, to give the pilot directions, what, you know, left bank, right bank, whatever. Um, anyway, we, we, we got most of that gang, which was, which was good news. Eh?